Hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Munoz. I am the Waterways Manager for the Conservation Department. And on behalf of Hispanic Access Foundation, we thank you for making the time to be here and be present as we unveil Hispanic Access' first ever Latino Voices of the Mississippi River, a poll conducted by the bipartisan research team, FM3 and New Bridge Strategy. This work was made possible with the support of the Walton Family Foundation and Liquid IB. Today, we will highlight some of the key findings of the survey. The pollsters will walk us through the methodology and we will hear from some inspiring community members that will share their experiences and will end with time for questions and a moderated discussion. With us today is our incredible translator, Natalia, who will be in our interpretation line, making this webinar accessible in Spanish. If you would like to access our interpretation line, you can click on the um, more setting or the globe icon that says Spanish. Today's PowerPoint will also be available in Spanish and the link can be found in the chat. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please save those questions until the end of the presentation. All of today's resources, such as the recording of today's webinar, the PowerPoint and the full results will be available online in our website at the end of today's event. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Karina Mesa, Hispanic Access Chief of Communications, who will give us an insight on Hispanic Access mission and the importance of making resources such as this poll available to our community. Karina, take it away. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Karina Mesa, the Chief of Communications at Hispanic Access Foundation. We're so thankful to you all for joining us. At Hispanic Access, our mission is to connect Latinos with partners and opportunities to improve their lives and create an equitable society. We hope that one day, every Latino in America will enjoy good physical health and a healthy natural environment, a high quality education, economic success, and civic engagement in their community. And this is why I'm so thrilled to be here with you all, where we will present the groundbreaking results of the first ever Latino Voices of the Mississippi River poll. This poll is significant because it reveals the deep commitment Latinos have towards environmental stewardship. Conservation encompasses more than just safeguarding our land, water, and climate. It also involves our health, the economy, our cultural heritage, the well-being of our families, and social justice. Releasing a survey that captures Latino viewpoints is crucial for representation, equity, and inclusion, addressing disparities and influencing change. Latinos are a significant and growing demographic in many regions, including the 10 states along the Mississippi River. Understanding their perspectives ensures that their voices are included in discussions and future decisions that affect their lives and their communities. The Latino viewpoints depicted in this survey highlight the importance of equity and ensures that no group is overlooked. It can help correct historical underrepresentation and ensures that diverse perspectives are considered in shaping public policy and social initiatives. By understanding the environmental and social concerns of communities of color, we can move forward in addressing disparities and develop targeted solutions to improve these communities. This information can help catapult Latino leaders into action and help drive for change. These findings underscore the readiness of Latinos to be heard and their eagerness to advocate for meaningful change. As we approach an election year, it's crucial for both local and national leaders to take these views into consideration. We must pursue policies rooted in justice and equity and ensure that the voices often marginalized are central to our efforts for positive change. Thank you everyone for coming and I'll hand it back to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Karina, um, for your incredible perspective of making these resources available and accessible as we approach an election year. It is crucial that we understand how these different viewpoints can raise awareness on issues that may not be widely recognized. So today we are joined here by Karina, our uh, Chief of Communications. Um, we're joined here by Dave Metz from FM3, um, which is part of the research team, and Lori Weagle from Newbridge Strategy. Um, we will have these amazing panelists, Magali Rojas, an environmental justice advocate. 
and student from the University of Kansas, Missouri. We'll also have Miguel Juanes, who is an environmental educator and photographer from Kentucky, and John Rusky, a, the founder of Lower Mississippi River Foundation, joining us from Mississippi. Now, let's take a closer look at some of the work we do in our conservation department. Our conservation department focuses on four main pillars. We focus on um, public lands and nature protection, oceans and coasts, waterways and watersheds, and climate crisis. We do all of this work and it's driven by creating research and resources. We have all of these resources that can be found online and can be used to advocate for your community and as policy recommendations on a state and federal level. We engage communities through storytelling. We have all of these amazing films that could also be found on our website. And we build leaders. We have a conservation network council and our faith-based leaders for la creación, and they drive all of this incredible work to move us forward in this environmental climate. We also take action through Latino Conservation Week, which is a week dedicated to bringing communities outdoors to protect their natural resources. This year, it's coming up on September 14th through the 22nd. We also have Latino Advocacy Week, where we bring our network members and communities to advocate for themselves at Capitol Hill. And these are both initiatives that help us drive our work into action. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, let's dive into our full details. Let's set the stage on what Latinos think on the environment. So now we will take the moment to be joined here with Lori and Dave, who will provide a better insight on their work and give us a better understanding on the methodology of the survey. Lori, Dave, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, and thank you for the chance to join all of you today. We're very excited to share the findings of this first of its kind survey. Um, you'll see on this slide a little bit about the methodology of the research. Um, before I review that, I should just probably note the reason why you have two pollsters with you today. Um, my firm, FM3 Research, when we poll for candidates, only poll for Democratic candidates. And my colleague, Lori Weigel, at Newbridge Strategy in candidate races, only polls for Republicans. Um, the two of us have come together to do this research to make sure that it was both designed and analyzed from a bipartisan perspective. Um, and we have been working together as a bipartisan research team doing similar research across the country, including some prior surveys on the Mississippi River um, for a little over 20 years now. So there's a number of places where we may make reference to some of the things we've learned in other research that may be uh, helpful as a comparison point for, uh, for what we learned here. Um, briefly, the methodology of the survey involved speaking to 760 registered voters across the uh, 10 states that border the Mississippi River. In each state, we spoke with voters who live in one of the two counties that are closest to the river. So we weren't speaking to people statewide, just those that are roughly adjacent to the river itself. Our sample included 400 Latino voters, and it uh, included the balance 360 voters of other races and ethnicities. Um, that allows us to draw some comparisons between the attitudes of the Latino population and the broader population of these river adjacent counties. Um, the focus today obviously will be on the results among those Latino respondents. And methodologically, in order to ensure that we had the broadest and most diverse sample of uh, voters uh, in our uh, pool for the survey, we conducted the interviews both by telephone, calling people on landline and wireless phones, and then also sent them text invitations to invite them to an online version of the survey. Interviewing was also conducted both in English and in Spanish. Um, so with that, we'll hand it back to Vanessa. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave and Lori, because without their hard work, none of this would have been possible. They do such incredible and thorough job that it amazes me how easy they make it look. So highlighting Latino opinions can be can drive broader societal and political change. 
by raising awareness of issues that may not be widely recognized. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Magali Rojas, who is joining us from Missouri and who will share their work, story, and experiences in her community. Magali, take it away. Hi, thank you, Vanessa, and everyone at the Hispanic Access Foundation for allowing me to present today. As you said, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and a lot of my work is done within the intersection of health, the environment, and social justice. So I am based from Kansas City, and in Kansas City, we have the Blue River. The Blue River is approximately 40 miles of river, and its headwaters are located in Kansas City, Kansas, over on the Overland Park side in the Olathe area. And it flows through Jackson County and Kansas City, um, and then it flows and intersects and confluences with the Missouri River. And in Kansas City, uh, geographically, it is made up of bluffs. It is made up of limestone and bedrock cliffs. And there is um, the type of weather that we receive there is coming from Canada and the Gulf of Mexico. So there are hot summers and cold winters. And um, the kind of issues that you see as far as weather, you see flooding, tornadoes, and drought. And because we have a lot of old infrastructure in Missouri, um, a lot of buildings known as Brownsville buildings, we have um, railroads that go from the inception of, of the city, which was in the early 1830s, and so there are lingering legacy pollutants there um, that affect the river and the health of the people living there. Um, so one of the things that we that I have done in my work, I used to work for a nonprofit organization, and I was doing a lot of their environmental justice, meeting with the people um, living in areas that are known as environmental justice areas, where areas that um, have people that are minorities, black and brown, um, or that are low income families with single income, working mothers, um, disabilities, um, a lot of those different factors. And we try to provide information, um, solutions that can be done in their own backyard. A lot of it dealing with conservation and natural resources, invasive species management. Um, and that's the, the removal of um, whether it is a plant that is not native to the area and it's causing some sort of disruption to the earth something like erosion, um, that there's no water filtration. And a lot of this has caused damage to the Blue River. Um, the Blue River, as you see in my picture, this is an old postcard that I'm using, um, where the river was really populated at some point. It was used as a place of recreation, a place to interact with the Blue River and to um, be able to also do a lot of the transportation there with the steamboats. Um, so the, the river has had a lot of years of use. Um, it's also have areas where it's most polluted, um, a little bit about Kansas City. So it's a bi-state area. There's Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri. So it's that much as difficult to be able to um, come together and organize communities to get them to vote, to get them to understand about the issues environmentally that um, are pertaining to the river and their own health. So I think when it comes to um, these e ecosystems that are being impacted um, by the different um, sources of pollutants, it is important to recognize um, the Latino population, which has grown 
about 40% since the 2010 census in Kansas City, um, up to the 2020 census. And that's as far as we know um, for how we're interacting. But um, yeah, if you'd like to talk more to me um, about those natural solutions that can be applied, I'd be happy to share more. Um, I do have a, a background in environmental assessment that I like to share with you all. But thank you again um, for letting me take a moment to share with you all. Thank you so much, Magali, for this wonderful insight. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up um, pollutants because this is actually something that we'll be covering in our results. So let's move on to some of the results, um, some of the key findings from this poll. So when Latinos were asked, when considering the following issues, this is lat what Latinos voters were concerned about. So the issue was plastic pollution in the ocean. 76% of Latinos thought this, this was an extreme and very serious problem. 74% of Latino voters thought that pollution of rivers, lakes, and streams was an extremely or very serious problem. 67% of Latinos were concerned about climate change. 60% of Latinos were concerned about pollution of the Mississippi River. 58% of Latinos were concerned about extreme heat. And 62% of Latinos were concerned about air pollution. And lastly, 63% of Latinos were concerned about access to clean drinking water. All of these statistics are really important to considering how these issues affect the community on the ground and how all of these issues are specific to the different states um, across the Mississippi River. So um, also just as a reminder, all of these statistics will be shared online after the presentation. But let's move on to some of our water concerns. And rivers and streams are the lifeblood of our planet. They have sustained human civilization and ecosystems throughout history. These meandering currents, majestic flows, and interconnected networks shape the very essence of our natural world, including where and how we live. Surrounding communities have a profound connection with the iconic Mississippi River. And before we dive into the data about what, Latinos, what Latino communities think about the river, let me introduce you to Miguel Juanes, who is joining us from Kentucky and will share their work, story, and experiences in his community. Miguel, take it away. Hi, everybody. My name is Miguel Juanes. Happy to be here. And I love that I get to be part of these conversations now. And the reason why that's important is because part of my story is my transition out of, I was working as a retail manager for Costco. And after the pandemic, <clears throat> something in me just really became more aware of the environment. And I shifted my career path towards one of education. And I decided to pursue environmental education. So I was able to get my certification this past uh, April. And I've been working with youth uh, for a while now in Texas and in different capacities throughout my time, but volunteering and doing work with students in the field has been extremely eye-opening. You know, working with young people in general, you know, we see the trend of students being able to pick up the mantle of concerns. And those concerns have been expressed to me at the age, you know, that I wasn't even aware of these things when I was experiencing that in my community. And with Latinos in Kentucky making up about 20% of the population as of the latest census, you know, it is important that at least people see someone like me out in the field hiking, and in my case, doing photography, and kids really do find that as an interest of like a hook. So I've been very fortunate to try to use that uh, skill set to drive the message of not only can you make art when you're out in nature, but you can also highlight conservation stories, highlight issues, problems, use the ability to capture an image, tell a story, and just get everyone involved in the understanding that this is something that we have to care for. And so having all that kind of been in my head for a while, you know, thinking of how I could take action, you know, I got involved uh, with state government. So now I'm working with digital equity at the capacity with, with Frankfurt, but because I have the ability to talk and network with people, I've also learned how to find resources and how to understand things. So 
just from my own knowledge, I was able to pick up on what are some of the values or some, sorry, what are some of the things that are that are being highlighted in Kentucky specifically around water. And since I do look for waterfowl and experience, you know, my share of concern when I see a stream that has, you know, pollutants in it, trash, and it kind of makes me sad that that's the state in some of these waterways, but also the fact that when I take students to see those exact places, they also see that and they recognize that we have to change it. So just getting involved with knowing how to access resources has been really important for me to share with, with the students as well. And some of the things that I've learned is that, you know, with over 90,000 miles of rivers and streams in Kentucky, the Commonwealth does care. So as a state, Kentucky is taking a huge interest in making sure that we don't have any runoff, that we also have, you know, the farm waste management approach be consistent since farming is a huge part of the economy here in Kentucky. Uh, there's a group that works with the um, idea of nature-based solutions. So we try to mimic nature to have an impact on the situation as opposed to going in and doing more modern or maybe not even modern, but, you know, relying on concrete or relying on other things instead of using different, uh, you know, grasses to help, you know, certain, you know, drainage issues and things like that. Um, you know, looking at retentions for river basins and other ways that you can take a bigger view of what to do in, 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 in an area that with so much waterways and systems that, that at work. So it's, it's very key uh, for me to kind of now take that information to the young people and work with them to try to get inspiration of how to tell the story in their communities. It, and again, it starts with, with an interest with a hook, right? So the photography one is, is my passion for that. And I'm hoping that through the work that we're doing, uh, I can have access to even more young people and become uh, a better conduit of, of information or how to find information from your state government, you know, how to network and how to find, you know, the resources to get things done if it's a grant that can help. But um, there's a lot that goes on as far as even thinking about the the tie-in with with photography and, and, and art, but I think this is it's a really strong one and I'm happy to be a, at the forefront of it here, at least in my little neck of the woods in Frankfurt. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miguel. And I love that you mentioned resources because oftentimes I feel like there is a lack of resources and a lack of accessibility in different languages. So it's really important mm -hmm. to highlight that. Um, and I appreciate your love for our um, environmental uh, environment and for the representation um, in the outdoors. Yes, thank you so much. It's a beautiful place to be. And I'm happy to, again, just continue working with you to build that capacity at the level we need it the most. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, now let's move on to some of the different data that we found um, when it comes to the Mississippi River. So these are some of the different potential threats um, that we saw uh, when asked whether it was a major or minor threat. Um, threat. So the potential threat was trash dumped in rivers and streams. 93% of Latinos think that this is a major, major threat. Um, when it comes to chemicals and waste, from industry, 88% of Latinos think this is a major threat. When it comes to overdevelopment and loss of natural areas close to the river, 81% see this as a threat. When it comes to flooding, 83% of Latinos think this is a threat. When it comes to microplastics, 89% see this as a major threat. When it comes to PFAS, or what we also know, know as forever chemicals, uh, surprisingly, 86% of Latinos think this is a threat. Um, when it comes to runoff from large agricultural operations, which uh, Miguel kind of uh, touched base a little on, 81% of Latinos see this as a threat. And lastly, when it comes to overfishing, 63% of Latinos see this as a threat. And let's dive a little deeper into more results. So what do Latinos think? Um, when it comes to describing how often they use and why they visit the Mississippi River. Um, a 51% of Latinos frequently or occasionally visit the Mississippi River for their mental health. 48% uh, frequently or occasionally visit the Mississippi River for attending a festival, volunteering, or for a community event. And we know that rivers can bring people together. So it's really nice to see those percentages. And 63% of Latinos 
uh, frequently or occasionally use this area for walking, biking, or hiking on parks or trails by the river. So we see these interesting statistics on how this river is used and why it's important for communities. So now let's take a look at conservation in the Mississippi Pole. River conservation initiatives would have far better results if they made a greater effort to engage and help remove the barriers that impede communities from joining and becoming passionate river advocates. Let me introduce you to John Rusky, who is joining us from Mississippi and will share their work, story, and experiences in his community. John, take it away. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Um, Maya Lee and uh, Miguel, thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you all today. And um, everything that you're experiencing up on the Blue River up in uh, Kansas City, uh, which comes down the Missouri River and into the Mississippi at St. Louis and on down through uh, lower Illinois, through Kentucky, and everything you're experiencing in Kentucky eventually comes uh, down into the stretch of river that uh, I'm in uh, today, which is considered uh, the lower Mississippi River. And it's the last 954 miles of the Mississippi uh, from the Ohio River to the Gulf of Mexico. And so uh, we all live downstream is, uh, is a saying, and we certainly do. And we're all connected to the river connects us all. And uh, I'm originally from Colorado, seven generation Colorado family, born and raised uh, in New Mexico, Colorado, with uh, a lot of river time. I've always been a water boy. I've been on the uh, Rio Grande and the uh, Rio Colorado and the uh, Urique Batopilas of Northern Mexico and down the whole Mississippi River after high school graduation, uh, which brought me here to this big, wild and wonderful river. It's the, the, the Mississippi River at its biggest and uh, most, um, most vital. Uh, it has its richest forests and richest farmland and um, and it's a very uh, um, uh, low inhabited uh, uh, rural uh, area, uh, agricultural predominantly, but uh, a lot of uh, open forest also and big river, sweeping river views uh, uh, and landscapes. And um, the Lower Mississippi River Foundation that I, I founded in 2011, which is the same year that we had that great flood uh, highest water since 1927 came down the Mississippi River, and in some places it was higher than 1927. Um, me and a group of, uh, of river passionate advocates created a conduit to um, uh, provide more experience uh, for everyone who lives on the shores of the Great River. And um, we knew, because I'm a lifelong uh, river rat, and we knew that you could talk all day long and teach all day long and even watch movies all day long about the Mississippi, but you would still not really understand until you had an experience on that great river. And it could be taking a walk or biking or fishing, but there is nothing more meaningful and impactful than actually getting in a canoe or a kayak or stand up paddleboard or swimming, and it is safe to swim in the Mississippi River, and I'll talk more about that with anybody who wants to talk about it, because I swim in it every day. I'm out there, and we teach people how to swim in the Mississippi, like a baptism almost. But our work is uh, is uh, has become focused on uh, running week-long summer camps um, for high school youth um, to create long-term uh, relationships with this great waterway um, that's kind of hiding on the other side of the levee. Uh, we have the reality of the farmland and the communities on one side of the levee, 
and uh, it's kind of cookie cutter and everything's in straight lines. And then you go over the levee and it's the domain of the big river. And she's our queen, we're her worker bees. And we, um, we build canoes and um, uh, run uh, week long summer camps um, that uh, uh, provide experience for high school students from um, uh, 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 from uh, se uh, severely distressed neighborhoods and impoverished neighborhoods. It's open to anybody, but um, we uh, focus on those who do not have the same opportunity as others to go to the similar kind of summer camp in the Great Lakes or Appalachia or up in the Northeast. And um, it has proved, proved to be successful. We see, we're seeing kids come back and starting to teach the next generation as uh, leaders of the same summer camp. Thank you so much, John. Um, and I love that you mentioned, you know, the river can have multiple uses, but I love that you highlight the importance of it for recreation and as a place for gathering and connection. Um, how about we take a closer look at some of the results when it comes to the Mississippi River? So when it comes to the nation's public lands, which priority should your member of Congress put first? Ensuring we protect water, air, wildlife, and recreation on our public lands, even if it means less is available for oil and gas drilling and mining, or ensuring we produce more domestic energy by maximizing the public lands available for responsible oil and gas drilling and mining, even if it means less, is available for air, water, wildlife, and recreation. So specific to Latinos, 71% said that we should protect as opposed to 22% who said we should produce um, more domestic energy. Moving on to some more interesting statistics. When we asked Latinos what they think when it comes to describing the Mississippi River. We had our options of very well, somewhat well, don't know, not too well, or not at all well. 51% of Latinos said that it was threatened. 65% said it was polluted. 78% said it was important to the economy. 83% said it was a national treasure and 78% said it was very important to people in my community. Now let's take a closer look at some of the policy takeaways. Let's take a look at some of the different results from this poll. So Latino voters support a range of specific policies to protect and restore the river. When asked, providing incentives to farmers to encourage them to use sustainable practices that improve soil health 92% of Latinos were in total support. 89% of Latinos were in total support of providing funding to help local communities recycle wastewater by treating and purifying it to make it safer for use. 91% of Latinos were in total support of creating new national parks, monuments, and wildfire refuges to protect historic sites. And 93% of Latinos were in total support of providing funding to prepare and prevent for worst impacts of flooding. Some more results to highlight is the US government has a set a goal, which some people call 30 by 30, to pursue a locally led effort to conserve and restore 30% of America's lands and fresh waters, meaning rivers, lakes, and streams and 30% of our ocean areas by the year 2030. Does achieving this goal sound like something you would support or oppose? 87% of Latino voters were in total support as opposed to 7% who were in total opposition. So we can see that Latinos are concerned about the future of nature, meaning our land, water, air, and wildlife, and want to address climate change. Latinos strongly support conserving 30 by 30 and Latinos support investing in traditionally disinvested communities with more parks and access to clean water. And Latinos in our community love clean water. So these are some of the different key findings that we wanted to highlight today. Now we will have time for some questions 
and answers from our participants. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I already see some different questions that have been um, brought up by some of the different members. We have one question in the chat. And it was from, let me see. We have one question in the chat. And the question was directed towards Dave and Lori. The question is, could you please clarify how you ensured a representative um, sample? You mentioned reaching out to registered voters initially. How did you obtain this information and why did you choose this group? Also considering that many Latinos in the US may not be registered to vote, how does this impact the representative representativeness of this sample. Lori, Dave, take it away. Sure, I can start. Um, so since we were talking about so many different aspects of uh, public policy and things that would be facing Congress and other, potentially uh, other um, legislative bodies, the decision was made to look at voters. Um, voter information is public. And so we are able to know whether someone is registered to vote and in which state and even in which county. Um, and so we looked at that population um, for Latinos. Obviously it is not, does not include people that are you know, not registered to vote or not able to register to vote. So clearly their views could be somewhat different, um, but given the some of the significant findings that Vanessa just talked about, uh, we wanted to focus in on that universe of the population. To ensure the overall representativeness of the sample, as Lori noted, because voter registration files are public information, we know both for all voters in our targeted geographies and also for the Latino voters in our targeted geographies, uh, the distribution by age, by gender, by political party affiliation in states where that's uh, something that's on the record, um, by geography, and a number of other demographic values. And so that allowed us to set quotas for our interviews where we could uh, make sure that the pool of people we spoke to in the survey demographically resembles the broader pool of voters from which they were drawn. Um, and Dave, Lori, we have uh, another question for you both, which is, were there any state slash regional variations among the counties polled? And as a follow-up, how significant was Illinois' participation in this survey? So we sampled each state uh, in proportion to its population uh, of those counties along the river. Um, Illinois, I believe, was about 10% of our overall sample. Obviously, the population of Illinois is weighted toward Cook County and Chicago, which does not border the Mississippi River. So um, uh, they're a smaller share of the, of the river adjacent counties, although obviously there's plenty of po population in Illinois along the, the river. Um, I'm sorry, what was, uh, remind me again, Vanessa, what was the first part of the question? The first part of the question was, were there any state slash regional variations among the counties polled? Yeah. Um, we didn't see a lot of variations by geography in the survey. Obviously, whether they live further north or, or closer to the, the delta, the one thing that the residents have in common is that they all live close to the river. And um, you heard as, as the results were reviewed, how important they view it as being to their life, both in terms of their quality of life, being an economic engine for the region, things like that. Um, there were some differences by age or by partisanship, but generally speaking, uh, the differences by geography were relatively modest. We have another question for you both. Um, did the polling provide any sense of the percentage of Latinos who hunt or fish on the near or near the river or the importance of this group of having access to these activities and protecting habitat that supports it? So we did ask about uh, fishing 
as well as hunting. Uh, the question was, how often do you visit the Mississippi River for each of the following purposes? And they could have said frequently, occasionally, rarely, or not at all. Um, for fishing, if we look at, um, again, just the uh, Hispanic population, looking at those who said frequently or occasionally for fishing, it was 19% basically about the same as we saw in the overall sample, which was at 20%. For hunting, it was far lower. It was at 6%, which is exactly the same in, as the um, overall results. Of course, there were other things, other activities. Bird watching, for example, was higher at 29%. So there's a range of ways that people can interact with wildlife. We've tended to see um, across all the conservation work that we do, that conserving wildlife habitat is something that people value and that it's very close to, if sometimes not on par with uh, their focus on uh, water and making sure that we're protecting water quality um, as well. So hopefully that answers the question. Vanessa, remind me if there's any other aspects. Yes, no, that was great. Okay. Um, I have more questions. Um, According to, this is from Estefania, according to a NISO study last year, the general population was about 52% concerned about population or pollution. Is there a reason the Latino population would be more concerned about this? What does this tell us about the politics of this community in the basin? That is a great question. Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of things that I'll mention in that regard. Um, the first is that it, it's something we see very commonly in our research across the country on issues relating to the environment, um, that Latinos express higher degrees of concern about air and water pollution than um, and pollution on land as well than what we see among the rest of the population. Uh, one reason for this, obviously, are environmental justice concerns. Um, many Latinos within the United States live in communities that are disproportionately burdened by sources of pollution. Um, and so it's a, a recognition of, of that reality. But even setting that aside, we also see among Latino voters regularly stronger support for conservation proposals, uh, stronger uh, support for policy proposals designed to promote public health by reducing pollution, um, and I think that's part of a cultural ethic that is uh, present among Latinos in the United States, that there is a, a shared responsibility for protecting the environment um, that expresses itself in both concern about threats to the environment and support for policies to address it. Um, so I think both of those dynamics are in play in, in these numbers, which, you know, again, are very similar to what we've seen in, in lots of other studies. Wonderful, thank you for that. And before we move on to William, who I see has his hand up, there's one other question on what were the differences by age? And these results will be available on our website afterwards, which has all of those details. But um, if you'd love to answer, we can address that question now. Yeah, we have stacks of data. So I'm not sure I'm gonna capture every single <laughs> distinction by age, but generally we saw that those younger populations uh, do tend to be somewhat more concerned uh, than, and I use these terms loosely, than somewhat older populations in terms of some of these issues, but things like clean drinking water, things like concern about loss of wildlife habitat. I mean, that's something that is a shared concern. And so sometimes we'll see a few distinctions, but does that mean there's massive differences? No, not really. I think there's a lot more in common across this data than um, than any sort of, you know, major distinctions by age or, um, you know, by many of these other uh, aspects within the, especially within uh, the Hispanic population here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and now I can unmute William and you can ask your question. William, um, you can unmute yourself. If you are still there. All right. Um, if not, William. Hello. Hello. Perfect. 
You have a question for us? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I have a question. So, um, what is what is the uh, what kind of company uh, cre cre create more pollution in the River Mississippi? So the question was: Is there any specific companies that produce? Yes, pollution? yes. Uh, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. Do, do you have any knowledge about that? What is the company? If you have you have names or not, or do you have any information about that? That's a great question, William. Um, and I don't believe I have any specific um answers for that. Um but we can look into it. Um and uh we can circle back. And if there's also any other questions that we don't get to, we can uh, most definitely circle back through email. Yeah, and Vanessa, someone's mentioning in the in the chat that uh, you know much of the pollution in the Mississippi comes from farm runoff, uh, so really kind of distributed across that that sector rather than you know individual companies. So while lots of people think of industrial pollution. Obviously, the agricultural runoff is is a is a significant threat. So I don't know if you want one of the panelists to speak to that. They're probably better able to talk to that than the pollsters. Yes, and I think this kind of is a perfect segue for a question that we have on the chat, which is we'd love to hear from the panelists on the polling data. Was anything expected or surprising? And how does this polling data show up in your daily work? Um, and any of you can answer. I give the floor away to any of you. Uh, I'll speak a little bit on the, the the interest to me is just how much the really Latino community understands the nuance. I just, in the times I've been out exploring or, or photographing and a family, and, and seriously, a, a family comes up and asks me, you know, wow, what is that? What are you doing? And 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 I explain kind of what I'm doing and, and it's superficial, but there's always that want of um, you know, how how can I do it or or how can I, you know, what does it take to be a photographer and whatnot? And I always start off by saying just it's 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 an environmental uh feeling that you want to capture, a moment you want to capture. And then sometimes I'll say, Well, what about all the trash? What about all the stuff that you see back there? Do you hide that? And I'm like, no, I think that's important, even in some cases, very important to highlight. So in a way, maybe the data of concern when it comes from a visual standpoint is, is highlighting that we're aware of these things because we see them. Um, but I've, I've always been left a little bit um, kind of, I wish I had more to say about what, what we can really do to make this you know, become a non-issue, but it, it has to do more with, I think in some ways, getting them uh, involved. I've seen some events through the different uh, groups here locally in Frankfurt that are trying to get people to you know have a day out a nature walk or activities that are people that put Latinos out in nature and unfortunately I think sometimes you know the fact that we work multiple jobs uh, statistically speaking you know that's that's a higher rate of, of burden on the household to have that luxury and I, I say luxury but I also mean more of the time available to, to, to feel those issues and deal with them or work to deal with them is it was a little hard but I, I see that people do care surprisingly a lot of the time. Thank you, Miguel. Any other of our panelists that would love to sh share? Kind of going off of uh, what Miguel just said about how the communities interact with those natural resources, I mean, with the data of um, to seeing, you know, Latinos interact because of mental health, like that was information that for me, it is more surprising. Um, I remember going to Mexico and seeing Latinos in the parks and, and I don't see that as much in certain places. I guess if it's there and there's opportunities for recreation, then you will have it, but you have to also understand the different ways that Latino interact with different outdoor spaces. Um, and uh, also that that it's predominantly something that, you know, we see as conservation being for um, the white population. So it, that also plays a big role in the way that we bring people outdoors, especially as we're talking about our, our comunidad. 
That's a great point. And also I have a question for John. Um, the survey data shows that 65% of Latinos view the Mississippi River as polluted. How do these perceptions align with what you see on the ground? And what steps are necessary to address these environmental challenges? Uh, well, I definitely agree. The uh, Mississippi River is a uh, polluted river um, compared to uh, this fresh water that I'm drinking here in my glass, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, we swim in it every, uh, every time we go to the river. We draw water and filter it and uh, make our food from it, boil our, our, uh, our pasta or our beans and, and uh, brew up a cup of coffee. So, uh, and um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they do a annual toxicology testing on the lower Mississippi and year after year, they find that the uh, cleanest uh, fish in the state of Mississippi anyway, um, come from the Mississippi River. So uh, it's a misperception because most people, uh, their experience, uh, 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 most Americans, when they cross the Miss, when the, their experience of the Mississippi is, is crossing the Mississippi uh, on an interstate bridge, and when you look down, you're either in Memphis or down here anyway, Baton Rouge, or uh, New Orleans or Vicksburg, and yes, it it looks pretty nasty because it's all industry, but the reality is that in between all this industry, is. Uh, mostly wild and um and latino uh miss there's there's not a uh, uh mississippi has has maybe some of the lowest latino population in in the nation but it's growing and um fishing and um and rivers as a spiritual experience are very important to uh to uh, families um and individuals and of uh, 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 create a place of deep, deep significance and meaning, and not to mention uh, sustenance. And um, you would not fish if you were, uh, if you thought you were on a, a river that was not safe to eat fish out of that river. And uh, so, but we see lots of uh, Latino and um, and African American and, uh, and 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 also white people uh, uh, fishing from the banks of the river. And those people aren't falling out. They're they're surviving and enjoying those good fish. And I think I have a question for you, panelists, as well. Um, what do you want decision makers and the media to take away from these results? Um, I have one thought, and I think it it goes back to the number. The for me, it, it's it's important that we find ways, and we continue to find ways to innovate the messaging to get people outside, but also, you know, look at at how to continue involving and in, in getting events that have an impact that don't just feel good, but that have a very substantive, you know, result. And I love that this is now probably going to be more, I think, on the minds of people than before. I feel those numbers are pretty impactful. Thank you, Miguel. Magali, John? I would oh. say, oh, go. Okay, thank you, John. I, I would say here that even though these numbers, we see them very frequently as far as, like, uh, we saw where illegal dumping was a big issue in a lot of places. I, that's very true, I think, for many states. Um, I think what's important to see from this data is not just the things that exist, but the different ways of innovating and attacking um, these issues, you know, and it depends on the communities where they're at. For some, it may be, um, you know, going out and speaking directly to the communities for some is providing more assistance with land management or more assistance with grant writing, making it more accessible to bring, um, you know, when it comes to accessibility to funding and money to those communities, sometimes it's really hard to produce language um, 
that can help with, with programs that will help fund um, those issues. So uh, again, making it more accessible to communities, meeting them where they're at and not expecting that everything is a monolith. Thank you so much. Um, John, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I wanted to encourage media um, to uh, 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 help us uh, make the connections. And I'm talking about all the communities, uh, rural and uh, suburban and uh, urban, and the uh, with uh, the rest of creation that lives over the levee. And I'm talking about the birds and the fishes and the uh, uh, crustaceans and amphibians because taking care of each other, um, all races uh, is, uh, and, and taking care of our mother earth, we're gonna have to all do it together. And that doesn't just mean us two-legged, it means the four-legged and those with wings and those with tails and those with uh, flippers or, uh, or fishtails. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And I have a, one more question for the pollsters. Um, a question from Anonymous said, did the attitude towards conservation slash preservation, uh, preservation vary by the voters registered political party? Oh, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> that's my party, that's a little lower on some of these. Um, yeah, so overall, within the data, there were some partisan distinctions. I'd say Republicans are uh, pretty consistently less likely to say that specific issues, whether it was air pollution, water pollution, a host of things that we tested um, that you talked about, Vanessa, uh, tended to be viewed as extremely or very serious problems. Um, that said, uh, you know, within when we talked about the Mississippi, there was some distinction there uh, on certain aspects, but for the most part, uh, respondents, irrespective of party, said it was something that's important to their community, something that's important to them personally. Um, there was about a 20 point gap when we looked at, uh, you know, something they felt responsible for personally. So, you know, again, some distinctions, but the more we focused in on the river itself, um, the less vast those distinctions were. So it tended to bring people together more than having it being a, a huge wedge, like some just broader conservation issues. Wonderful. And I would say that's typical too. The water is something that, you know, everyone sees their place in that and, and protecting it. And we all have a self-interest in, of course. So that's a fairly typical dynamic. Absolutely. I would definitely agree with that. Um, I um, want to give you a minute to see if there's any final thoughts between panelists. Because um, if not, I will go ahead and close our presentation for today. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here today and for joining us as we learn more about how Latino communities are often disproportionately affected by environmental issues, such as pollution and climate change. Their involvement ensures that these communities' specific concerns and needs are addressed, leading to more equitable and effective environmental policies and solutions. I want to reinforce and highlight that Latino opinions can drive broader societal and political change by raising awareness of issues that might not be widely recognized. Latino communities across the United States are experiencing disproportionate health and economic impacts of poor air quality, extreme heat, wildfires, droughts, storms, poor water quality, and other severe effects of climate crisis, in addition to the alarming loss of nature throughout the country. Yet the Latino community's overwhelming support for nature and climate action can show our leaders the way forward in ensuring a just transition to an economy that protects our climate, homes, health, and jobs. There are many resources out there on how you can advocate for the protection of your beloved natural resources, such as the Mississippi River. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to the experts like the pollsters for being here today. 
Um, we hope that you have a wonderful day and thank you again for making the time to be here and be present as we unveiled today's survey. As a reminder, it will be available online and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day.